Gentlemen, please take it away. Matt, I'll let you start off here since you get all the fun slides. Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Janis, and uh, I'm the Senior Safety Consultant with Spooner. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here discussing some uh, safety-related items concerning the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we're all dealing with right now. Um, to start off our, our brief topic overview here, workplace safety guidance, in particular a couple things, preparing and responding and really focusing on the prevention of the spread of this virus. That's the, the main focus everyone's worried about right now. And the prevention hierarchy based on your exposure risk level, the, the level of exposure that your employees are gonna be facing based on your industry. And I think a lot of us are, or a lot of you are gonna be in the same industry. I mean, manufacturing works. We're focused around manufacturing here. So that's gonna narrow things down a little bit and make things easier for us from, uh, from this topic standpoint here. So we're also gonna address some OSHA and safety related frequently asked questions. Some things that we've been hearing uh, quite often, some not so much, but we're gonna address some hot button ones that we've been hearing a lot. And then also Mike Kowalski is gonna touch on some BWC and workers' compensation related frequently asked questions that he's dealing with quite a bit as well. We're also going to cover a few good resources, some sources of information that I've been using, that I've been recommending people use. So at the end of the presentation here, we're gonna have a slide with some web links that's gonna provide some good information for you from sources like OSHA, BWC, EPA, CDC, all the big players in this thing. And we're gonna open it up to questions and answers from our audience. All right, getting into it, the next slide, please. So if you don't already have one, it's a really good idea to start taking notes as we're all going through this for an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. Um, a lot of your organizations probably already have something like this, maybe not specifically like this, but something like this in the way of, you know, contingency and continuity planning and considerations, you know, like, if something happens to the organization, something significant, how do we adapt and keep going successfully with our business? So for this specific topic, we're of course talking about monitoring guidance from federal, state, local authorities, recommendations they have for preventing the spread of this. You're also gonna want to assess your workforce, assess your employees' exposure to the risk levels. We're gonna get into that a little more specifically. But uh, I mean, manufacturing, what you're really gonna be focusing on is preventing spread. You're not frontline ER personnel. Like my wife, for example, she's an ER nurse. So she knows all this very well. You're not gonna be experiencing that kind of thing in a day-to-day -day manufacturing sense. Um, so you wanna assess your employees' exposure and risks from external factors and also internal factors, such as are your employees uh, at an older age bracket considered quote unquote high risk age, which is 60 and over? What about pregnant women or someone with a chronic illness that can compromise their immune system, their, their body's ability to fight this off? You wanna take some extra special precautions for people like that as well. Uh, and then again, some contingency continuity planning, um, accounting for things like this change in workforce, change in, in the way things are being done, the way tasks are being performed, the way employees are working. And also external factors there as well, like your supply chain might get disrupted. So not really from a safety sense, but you also want to take into account contingency continuity um, for the, the changes, adapting to just different changes in your industry to continue on successfully. Next slide, please. So this is what I was talking about, your, your risk levels. So 
starting at the top is your highest likelihood, your biggest risk. That is, as I said, an ER nurse, for example. Uh, healthcare workers on the front lines who have high likelihood of being exposed to a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19. During certain med medical procedures, not everyone across the board in healthcare, but those frontline workers performing certain medical procedures, they can likely come in contact and probably are on a day-to-day -day basis contacting people with COVID-19. The next one down, the orange, that is other hospital workers, other medical support staff that are uh, at a high exposure level because their work put, puts them at least in the environment. Uh, say they're doing something in the ER, not necessarily with a COVID-19 patient, but maybe they're in the ER. The next one down, the yellow, that's potential exposure, potential exposure to possibly confirmed cases. You're not sure whether or not it's a confirmed case or not. These are people in a high, densely populated uh, position, such as an airport employee. Uh, the next one down there, the blue, is unlikely exposure to confirmed or suspected cases, and that's going to be most of you in the manufacturing industry. That's the lower risk. The analogy I kind of thought of when I was going through all this is ventilators. That's a big hot button issue right now, you know, lack of ventilators or, or, or people worried that there's a lack of ventilators. So starting from the top, the, the, the top in the red, an ER nurse hooking someone up to a ventilator. That's a certain medical procedure, very high risk. Next one down would be uh, someone in support, maybe servicing a broken ventilator. They're in the environment, they're still high exposure, but not as high. Next one down, um, high densely populated. So let's say an airport employee where a shipment of ventilators is coming in. And then the last one down, is someone working in the manufacturing facility where that ventilator is being made. Next slide, please. Here we have the good old hierarchy of controls. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen this here or there. You're probably pretty familiar with it. This is how you address risk level. And in terms of COVID-19, this is a pretty specific area here. And I'll, I'll start from the top. Elimination, can you eliminate it? No, obviously not, at least not yet. We haven't figured that out yet. Can you substitute it for something less hazardous or altogether benign? No, that doesn't make any sense. Engineering controls, for the standpoint of manufacturing, we're not really going to focus on this too much, but to supplement your efforts, there, there might be something, you know, worth doing with uh, upgrading your HVAC or, or your filter system, something like that, but we're not really concerned with that so much. Administ administrative controls is where we really want to look. And, and, and the last one, PPE, you're not going to be focused with that too much unless you're, like I said, on the front line working face-to-face, -face, so to speak, with COVID-19. So administrative controls, you're going to work on changing the way employees are performing their duties. Next slide, please. So what you're going to do to protect your workers administratively, again, monitor the public health communications and recommendations. Make sure workers have access to all that info. Make sure you've uh, established an effective means of communication to spread the word on that. And as I'm sure you've know, anyone following the media knows that this, this kind of thing changes from day to day. So keep an eye on it without, you know, driving yourself crazy, which is not that hard to do. Uh, so a, a good kind of base of operations as far as websites go, and this will be included in that later slide I mentioned, is CDC's COVID-19 website listed there. So when we talk about administrative controls, your base that you're going to be going on, very simple. You got to remind yourself, you know, this is all stuff we learned in, in kindergarten and we just have to remind ourselves. Good hygiene practices, including if you're sick, stay at home. I'm sure you've established, uh, if you can, you know, those essential employees, essential meaning people that must remain on site to effectively perform their work. 
And then you've got non-essential employees who can just as effectively perform their work remotely, off-site. So hopefully you've kind of separated people and figured out who needs to stay, who can go and still work effectively. But still, anyone that needs to come in, if they're sick, stay home. One of the things you're seeing a lot now is monitoring people's temperatures. As we know, one of the biggest symptoms of COVID-19 is a, uh, a fever. So one of the uh, plans you might want to put in place, as we have at Spooner, is monitoring temperatures. Any, anywhere above 100 degrees, really, you're, you're, in, the, you're in the fever zone. You, you shouldn't be allowed to come into work. You should be staying home, taking care of yourself, monitoring that situation. Another very simple one that people sometimes, unfortunately, need to be reminded of is respiratory etiquette. If people are coming in coughing and sneezing all over the place, obviously, you know, this is, uh, this is spread most commonly, most uh, efficiently through aerosolized, you know, coughing, sneezing, breath in close contact, that, that kind of thing. So cover your mouth, use your elbow, that, that whole technique, cough in your elbow, sneeze in your elbow. And of course, proper, thorough, frequent hand washing. And as I look down at my hands, I've got cracks and they're, you know, I'm wiping little drops of blood away because I'm washing my skin away. But that's, I mean, something that has to be done. Thorough hand washing. You've heard the, the rule of thumb, you know, sing the happy birthday song, 20 plus seconds. And pepper in some, uh, some 60 plus percent alcohol sanitizer, especially if you don't have ready access to running water and soap. And also, if you have to have visitors or customers come into your facility, make sure they are also doing the same thing. Offer, you know, offer a, a bottle on the receptionist, receptionist desk of sanitizer, a, a box of tissues, their own trash can so they don't have to walk around into your area to throw away a snotty tissue. Um, another interesting thing that we just found out recently, it came to my attention, I actually Rick Dawson passed this along, but Geauga County, the Board of Health has started or is soon going to be starting a, a system of inspection, inspections to ensure that items like these are being complied with from a, from a Board of Health kind of standpoint. Um, keeping six feet in between employees, um, employees, uh, internal employees, and also customers and employees, um, making sure that, uh, you know, they have un, unfettered, I believe is the word, access to hand washing facilities, basic hygiene measures like that. So they're starting to check up on these things uh, with the Board of Health, at least in Geauga County. And next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So continuing on with administrative controls, as I mentioned, you've probably already done this, but looking at who needs to stay on site, who can work from home effectively, um, you know, flexible work sites, doing webinars such as where we are right now, as uh, opposed to in-person seminars. Spooner has actually had to cancel our annual Spooner safety seminar, and we're working on a webinar platform to take the place of that as well. Uh, sharing things that are touched often. I mean, you can't be sharing phones, desks, pens, pencils, office tools, equipment, machinery when possible. Don't share that as well. And if you have to, then make sure it's being sanitized frequently. Maintain your regular housekeeping schedule. Routine cleaning and disinfecting. And a note on this, another good uh, source here, that link there, which is included at the end as well, a list of not necessarily EPA approved, that's that's not exactly right, but a list of disinfectants that claim to prevent SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Um, EPA has made a note that they're not exactly endorsing the products, but it does offer a good list of products specifically designed to fight this and, and disinfect and, and kill the virus. So check out that link as well. And of course, when you're talking about chemicals, Follow the manufacturer's instructions, look through that SDS sheet, make sure you're not doing any mixing, make sure you're, if you do have to mix, make sure you're using the right proportions, the right pre PPE and all that good stuff. Next, please. 
So on to some frequently asked questions. This is probably the biggest one that we've heard, most common. Is COVID-19 a recordable OSHA 300 log illness? And the answer is it can be. It certainly can be. Now there is the common cold or flu exception where typical, uh, you know, this, this can seem like a cold or flu to some people, very serious, it's a, a different ball game, but it's kind of like that. But OSHA has specified, no, it does not fall into the common cold or flu exceptions. This is not common. So it can qualify there. Also, it must be a confirmed case. You've probably heard uh, some, some buzz phrases being thrown around, thrown around such as presumptive positive, presumed positive, or under investigation. This must be a confirmed case. Confirmed means it has been verified by the CDC. Presumptive positive or under investigation means that it's been confirmed at the local or state level and has been forwarded on to the CDC for official confirmation. That's what confirmed means. Now, back to work relatedness. This is where it can get kind of muddy, um, but for us here in manufacturing, not as much because we're, we're talking about people who generally remain in a facility for the most part. I understand, I'm sure you have sales staff and people getting out uh, and getting out into the public and doing that kind of thing, but you shouldn't have people doing that right now. So as far as possible, you should be you know, starting at the top of that hierarchy of controls list, knocking off the ones you can, limiting your workforce's exposure. And when we're talking about people in a facility, that's a much more controllable environment. Now, as far as work-related work cases go, if my wife, for example, the ER nurse, treating COVID patients every shift at work, day in and day out, if she comes down with COVID-19, she hasn't yet, thank God, but if she does, yeah, it's, it's probably, it probably happened at work. I think that's a pretty safe assumption. So in her case, it could be work-related. Now, it still has to meet the general recording criteria. So even if it's a confirmed case and you've decided it's work-related, it still has to meet the, the, the criteria such as involving days away from work or uh, you know, medical treatment beyond first aid. So it still has to meet the criteria. Next slide, please. This is an interesting one. So with everyone working home now, well, a lot of people working from home, uh, is an injury that occurs in the home office environment recordable? Well, the answer is it can be. So injuries and illnesses that occur while employees work from home, including the home office, are work-related if they occur while the employee is performing compensated duties at home and the injury or illness is directly related to the performance of work rather than to the general home environment setting. That's the key here. And a good example that uh, OSHA has given is if an employee drops a box of work doc documents, injures his or her foot, the case is considered work-related. That's directly related to, to their work tasks they were performing. Another one, if an employee's fingernail is punctured by a needle from a sewing machine used to perform garment work at home, becomes infected or causes medical treatment beyond first aid, uh, the injury is work-related. Now, if an employee, for example, is injured because they trip over the family dog while rushing to answer a work phone call, that is not work-related. That dog is not part of the work environment directly related to their duties. So it can be work-related there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is one we get pretty frequently just year-round that, that we have, but especially pertinent right now. Uh, if an employee wants to wear an N95 when it's not required, so let's think about the manufacturing environment and you're taking all the necessary precautions, people are spaced out, washing their hands frequently, all that. Uh, if an employee still wants to come in and wear an N95, can they do so? Well, that's, that's up to you. It's up to you whether you want to permit that or not. Uh, they don't have to wear it because the environment does not require it. But you could still allow them if it makes them feel more comfortable. You have to give them Appendix D to the respiratory standard. It's best to have them read through it and sign off on it as well. 
And that, that offers them some guidance, some basic things to do, such as read and follow the manufacturer's instructions with a respirator, including information on how to properly use it, maintain it, uh, care for it, store it, you know, the, the warnings and, and limitations and capabilities of that respirator. You also want to follow the gold standard, the certification by NIOSH, um, making sure that it's approved for the, you know, the contaminant that whatever hazard they're concerned about. Um, now this is their responsibility. Keep track of their respirator. They keep track of their own respirator, making sure they're not using someone else's by mistake, making sure they remember where they put it, they're storing it properly in their workspace. And they can't wear their respirator in areas with contaminants that the respirator is not designed to protect against, so the limitations of it. For example, particulate respirators don't protect against gases, vapors, and non-particulate components of fumes, mists, fogs, smoke sprays, etc. Now, when you're talking about voluntary use of an N95, you do not have to have a written respiratory protection program. You do not have to perform medical surveillance, you know, including that uh, the medical questionnaire. Uh, you don't have to have them fit tested. And of course, back to NIOSH, only allow and or provide NIOSH approved respirators. Next, please. Michael. Excellent. Everybody's favorite, BWC, right? Um, again, I'm Mike Kowalski. I'm the regional sales manager for Spooner um, and filling in for our claim or our client account services team right now because they are, are doing what we do best is taking care of our clients. So uh, I'm going to go over some of, of the most common questions we've been hearing from our clients. Uh, this was put together by the head of our client account services team. Um, but first and foremost it is, you know, will the BWC allow employers to delay installment payments due to COVID-19's hardship? Um, if anybody has been paying attention to wine with the wine at two, which it's been commonly known, uh, the governor has made some changes. Um, unpaid insurance premium installment amounts for March, April, and May for the 2019 policy year. So this current policy year can be deferred until June 1st, 2020. Uh, at that point, uh, the governor will probably reevaluate. Um, it, it's you know, depending on how well uh, we take care of this or if this is a, a continuing issue. This is for both private and public employers. The deferral is going to be automatic, so employers don't have to do anything. It's just going to automatically take over. Um, if you as an employer wish to submit the payments for March, April, and May, you're free to do so. Um, regardless, the BWC is not going to lapse or cancel coverages or assess penalties against you if you haven't paid over the next three months during the covid uh, pandemic. Uh, our recommendation is as an employer, if you're able to make the payments or even partial payments, uh, we advise that you do. Um, you don't want to get in a situation where come June 1st, um, you know, the governor says, all right, you know, this is now due and then you're going to have possibly a net 30 days to make three months worth of installment payments at once, uh, especially if you're trying to ramp back up and get your workforce up and running. It's uh, just one less headache. Um, but if, if you're dealing with some of the hardships that some of the employers in the state are, you have the opportunity that you can uh, defer those for the next three months. Next. So if I contract COVID-19, is it compensable? Uh, kind of piggybacking off of what Matt said, it really depends on how you contract it and the nature of the type of work you do. In general, when it comes to workers' comp, communicable diseases like COVID-19 are not workers' comp claims because people could be exposed in a different variety of ways. And few jobs have the hazard or risk of getting the disease, uh, like Matt spoke about, people on the front lines, people that are working, you know, EMTs, ERs, nurses, and doctors, they have more of a risk of catching it due to the nature of the work than uh, you may have in your manufacturing plant. Um, However, if you do work in a job that possesses a special hazard or risk, um, the BWC could allow your claim. Next. On top of that, if a worker is quarantined due to COVID-19 and they receive workers' compensation wage replacement benefits, uh, I'm sorry, can they receive? The BWC is only gonna pay compensation 
if the claim is allowed for this ability from the allowed conditions. So only if they approve the claim due to an actual work-related uh, condition. Now, the executive order issued by Governor Devine expands flexibility for Ohioans to receive unemployment during this declaration period. Um, for more information on that, we urge you to go to the Ohio Department of Jobs and Family Services. Again, this is changing on a daily basis. So as you have questions, definitely reach out to your third party administrator for workers comp. Uh, go to the, the sources that are provided by the governor, Department of Jobs and Family Services. Just because something's true today doesn't mean that it, it may not change tomorrow or a week from now. Uh, we all have to be diligent in doing our, our research and make sure that we are finding out as much as possible because uh, it, is, it is changing daily. Next slide, please. Uh, this just changed in the last 48 hours. Will BWC be extending program reporting and requirement completion dates? Uh, the BWC is waiving all safety, education, and training requirements for the current policy year, which is July 1st, 2019 through June 30th. For both private employers uh, and for public employers in the following programs. So the drug-free safety program, the experience mod cap program, Grow Ohio, industry specific safety program, the one claim program, and policy activity rebate program. Um, the discounts are going to be continued. Um, some of the, the deadlines were due March 31st, the, the governor and the BWC made those changes, like I said, in the last 48 hours. Uh, additionally, the annual report deadline, which was due on the 31st, uh, has now been extended to June 1st, 2020. So we do recommend that you stay on top of the drug-free safety program, make sure that you're filling out all the documents you need and make sure that you're getting that done by June 1st, 2020. Lastly, uh, I know Matt touched on this. If you want to go over some of the ones that, that you were mentioning to Matt, some of the resources. Yeah, thanks, Mike. This is the resource page. I was talking about uh, a lot of good information here. Um, the uh, OSHA safety and health topics page, I got a lot of information from there, some good basic guidance. Nothing earth shattering, nothing new from OSHA, just OSHA's perspective on it. You know, they, they haven't come up with any new standards, particularly on this. Uh, everything relates back to established standards. So we're talking about a hazard or a potential hazard in the workplace. How do you protect your employees from it? You know, that's, that's nothing new. Um, BWC frequently asked questions, the things that Mike discussed, and then some. Um, CDC general guidance. That's a good page. A lot of information from, from the CDC. The next one down there, the preparedness and response planning. Um, whether you're a family, an individual, a business, a lot of good information there on, on planning. And that EPA list of dis disinfectants, ones that, uh, that claim to um, be effective against the COVID-19 virus. A lot of good information in these links here. All right, and I believe the last slide there is just our contact information there. If you have uh, any more questions now or at any other time, feel free to give us a ring or shoot an email. Yeah, I, I know, and you had said that, that the chat is open. So if everyone, uh, if anyone hasn't been on one of these before, if you scroll to the bottom of your page, there's a, a little uh, chat link. You can type in your questions uh, and we can you know, answer them from here. You do have one question uh, that says, is the Ohio BWC suspending the on-site safety consulting requirement for the industry-specific program too? Matt, I'm not sure if you, you'd be better suited to answer this as far as the on-site. No, I'm not sure, Mike. That's uh, no, I'm not sure about the industry specific safety program with that requirement. No, that would be one that that if you want to email in or and if you can uh, share Robert's info, we can follow back up with them directly. Um, again, th these are the only thing that we've seen so far from the BWC was uh, that list that we had shown. 
Um, but I can double check it and get that back. So you can email it out if that helps out, Ann. Not sure what happened to Rick, but yep, um, I'm right here. <laughs> Actually, <question. laughs> no. uh, it says here if one of my employees shows symptoms and I send him home, do I need to shut down for how long? And am I required to professionally clean or do ourselves? Um, well, that's that's one where you're going to have to fall back on on guidance from from CDC. Use your best judgment. Um, you know, again, there, there's no new OSHA standard on, on this kind of thing. It's just use your best judgment, make, making sure you're following the, the, the hygiene principles um, and better safe than sorry, of course. It, you know, if, if you think that uh, people need to be monitored more closely, if, if someone shows symptoms, um, then that's what you need to do. You, you really want to follow the CDC guideline, guidelines for that kind of thing. And then we have a question here. It says, will Ohio waive the new order for 14 day quarantine for field service techs returning to Ohio from out of state? I mean, I, I think that just came out from the governor today, if I remember correctly. So I was, I was tuning into the, the governor's discussion. I don't think there's even any, any ruling on that yet. Again, uh, I think we all need to, to be diligent in making sure that we're going to the resources that that the governor's providing to make sure we stay on top of that. But uh, I'll do some digging around and see what I can find out on that as well. Any other questions from the group? Having a little technology issue myself here. So yeah, it doesn't look like there's any other questions right now. Uh, so what we can do is um, once uh, once we get the answers to some of these questions, we would be happy to uh, to send out the answers to this group. Uh, we do have your email addresses from your registration. So uh, if uh, the guys from Spooner would give us this, uh, this information and we can push this back out to you. <clears throat> we, do, uh, we do have one more question here. It says, does anyone know a company to hire for cleaning if we have a positive test? Um, you know what, we, Mike, do you know the name of the company that Spooner used? I know we recently did a, a deep cleaning. I Got don't. We can check with Joe Spooner on that one. Um, yeah. There's another one I know that's a local one called Puro Clean. Uh, I know they do disaster cleaning, um, and I know they're certified in, in, in things, it, you know, to the extent of like black mold and chemical cleanups. So I would say that would be one that, that you may want to explore. Yeah, Steve Craig. Yeah, I bet, I bet Serve Pro would be another option too. They do that sort of thing. Serve Pro. Serve Pro. Yeah, I, I think they're all getting a, a, an unusual increase in business. Yes, absolutely. Any other questions? Anyone else missing sports as much as I am? <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat box. So um, for, with that, then I, I thank everyone for joining us on the call today. Uh, thanks to Matt and Mike for sharing such valuable information. We encourage all of you to share with us your thoughts on topics you'd like to see covered in future calls like this, and we'll do our best to address them for you. Please stay tuned to your email as we announce our next call. And if there are other manufacturers in your network you think would benefit from this information, please feel free to share this with them or let us know and we'll be happy to reach out to them. As I mentioned earlier, an archived version of this call will be available on our YouTube channel, as well as the COVID-19 resources page on our website. Thanks again, stay safe everyone, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you.